Well, I'm really excited to be joined by Dr. Jennifer Finlayson Fife today. She is an LDS relationship and sexuality coach, as well as a licensed clinical professional counselor in the state of Illinois. She has her PhD in counseling psychology, and a lot of her teaching and coaching focuses on helping individuals and couples achieve greater satisfaction and passion, I like that, in their emotions and their sexual relationship. And you just do a ton of work. You do a lot of workshops, a lot of podcasts. Um, I'm a part of your online kind of Facebook group, yeah. um, which is wonderful just to help people have more conversations and to ask really sincere questions about, I don't know about this, but I want to know and I want good resources. So I've really appreciated and learned from you for many years. So I'm really excited to spend some time and chat with you today. Great. Thank you. It's good to be here. I was, I, I have to say, somebody pointed me to your TED Talk um, whenever that was, maybe a year ago, yeah. maybe a little more. And I was really thrilled to hear the things you were saying and, and to see you as somebody who could really be a really important resource for, for, for people, especially people of faith. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, I was looking, I actually did that TED Talk on my birthday. So I remember the date. It was October 26th, so almost a year ago. And that honestly was one of the scariest things I've ever done to venture online yeah. and to like, oh yeah, let's actually try to make a difference. And yet you've been doing yeah. that for many, many years now. So how did yeah. you get started? Where did your interest in sexuality and religion come from? Yeah. Well, I would say from a young age, I think I was always um, a deep theological thinker, to be honest. Like I, I thought a lot about, um, I grew up, you know, LDS, and I thought a lot about the principles I was being taught and um, things that felt true to me and why they felt true, things that felt less true to me and why they felt less true. And so I used to think about those things a lot. And I was also very much a student of human relationships. I would observe people a lot. And I thought a lot about, in particular, why some people were happily married and why some people were not especially because I saw it as a value that getting married was important, but I also strangely wanted to get married and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you can have both? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Cause as a kid, I was not certain that you could, especially as a woman. Cause I saw it as like, you kind of have to submit your life to oh. a man and his life, the way it was being taught to me and in, in a lot of my classes and things. And so I really cared about it. I really wanted to be married. I wanted to be happy. And so I was thinking about those things a lot. And eventually, once I got into college, decided I wanted to become a therapist and ideally a marriage therapist. So when I was in my PhD program, I had been studying a lot of think feminist theory mm -hmm. to kind of better understand it and think about it. And I had my issues with feminist theory, but I, there were also things that were very resonant for me and felt right. absolutely true. And so when I, um, went to my PhD program, I was about to get married. Um, I got married at 29. So I was older than mm -hmm. most um, people. Uh, many of my peers were already married. And I was asked to teach a human sexuality course um, to undergrads. And so I was now like, obviously, this was something I was thinking about a lot. And I was having these, uh, I was in a Jesuit school, a Catholic mm -hmm. graduate school at Boston College. And so a lot of these Catholic students were writing essays that really showed how much turmoil and conflict, especially the women were having yeah. around issues of sexuality and sense of self and whether or not they were good. And I made me really start thinking about my own experience as, um, as a Latter-day Saint and kind of was my experience, you know, was, how to say, it, the question that was driving me was, I could see a lot of ways in which um, the expectation that men and women remain chaste until marriage worked in women's favor in a mm -hmm. lot of ways, because in the sort of larger cultural expectation that, you know, meaning the non LDS expectation that like men, well, at least, at least what I saw too in my students was that it was more okay for men to be sexual than it was for women to be in oh, yeah. a kind of Catholic tradition. And so it was making me think about like this sort of single standard in some ways, does it work in women's favor? Because I certainly like the idea of committed sexuality, 
But on the other hand, I had a lot of friends that were very, very anxious about sex who'd gotten married and they're saying, Jennifer, it's not as great as you think. Like, don't let anybody trick you. Oh, no. <laughs> and uh, so I could just see, I had a lot of questions about what had been, what, how were women in the church doing in the transition from pre-marriage into marriage? Were these expectations protective of women or did they basically undermine women's sense of agency? So I did my dissertation on that. And then what ended up happening is that when I, I, I got my degree, but then I stayed home with my kids for a number of years. But then I was interviewed on my dissertation and the internet was becoming a thing. And, and so oh. then there just became this natural where people were asking me when I wrote it, I was like, I don't know if anybody will ever even read this because right. I don't know in which form I would even make this available to people. Um, but, um, but then when it was sort of time for me to open up my practice, there was a natural place to start to share some of my research and what I found. And so I just kind of literally got pulled into, I don't mean like that I didn't go there willingly and happily really working on not just couples issues, but couples and sexuality and, women and how they relate to sex and men and how they relate to sexuality and kind of what are the cultural traditions that had been inherited that were helpful and what were the ones that were interfering uh, with sexual integration, which is really kind of my desire and focus is to help people be able to better integrate the gift of sexuality and mm -hmm. also live in line with their values, with what they believe is good, with, with being people that are respect worthy and respectful of other people, having self-respect um, and being respectful through the way you're in relationship to others, inclusive of how you're in relationship to others with your sexuality. Mm -hmm. So that's been a lot of my focus. And so I do a lot of online teaching and you know podcasting and all of that. So, so yeah. That's wonderful. And so, so much of that. Long answer. No, that's great. And so much of that resonates with me where it just came from this curiosity. And it's like, I want to understand like all the factors and variables. And, yeah. and I grew up in the same faith tradition, LDS. And looking back, yeah. I don't know if I was that aware of it growing up, but men and women get different messages around yes. worth and modesty and sexuality and pornography. Yes. And now it's like, yes. whoa, this is a, a big issue. And as I've yes. thought about how all those factors contribute to a pornography concern, there's yes. often a focus on like, oh, it's the sexual images that's causing the problem. And I think, Absolutely. wow, that really oversimplifies all the complex yes. cultural and religious messages and values yes. that contribute to why somebody might struggle with pornography. In some ways, it's an easier target to say, you know, the sexual imagery is driving this person to do things that they are not comfortable with. And I'm not denying the power of sexuality, but I think we put, when we take the locus of control out of the person, we don't do them any favors. Yeah. And a lot of our messaging is sexuality is stronger than we are. And uh, I, I think it's a better focus to look at what's happening within the person that this is how they're choosing to relate to their sexuality. And what is it trying to solve and what is it actually um, creating that's more problematic? And I think when people can make that shift, then I see changes in kind of viewing patterns where it's like, oh, wait, maybe believing that these sexual images are more powerful than me, it limits that ability to actually reflect and to recognize that, yeah, we make decisions, our behavior's always in our control. But if we're not yes. aware of those factors, it feels like it's out of our control. It absolutely does, exactly right. And so, yeah, a lot of people feel out of control and they feel desperate to change something that they feel unable to change. And like you say, often that it's because of the lack of self-awareness, it's hard to actually see what the competing desires are and how that it's impacting what you're in fact choosing. Yeah. And so, yeah. Right. So let's maybe yeah. go into that a little bit more and, and sure. maybe share with us your thoughts on what are some of these messages that men get specifically that women get specifically that might contribute to somebody developing a problem with pornography or having a really strong reaction that their partner is struggling with pornography. Yeah. 
So I think, you know, and I'm speaking mostly from the faith tradition that I grew up in. I think this is kind of not unusual in, especially in uh, faith-based faith -based traditions. Um, but I think that when you grow up in any tradition where there's, where there's a conservative sexual ethic, and I don't mean politically conservative, I mean that, you know, one is cautious in their sexual expression. Um, there can often be ways in which we message what sexuality is as a way to contain mm. our children's sexual behavior, but in a way that interferes with being in a self-accepting and healthy relationship to one's sexuality. Yeah. And so I think that often this is also gendered. Um, and so a lot of times we take what may be somewhat natural differences between men and women and then exaggerate them into unhealthy positions. So one of the things I looked at a lot in my dissertation research is the way that we talk to men and women differently about sexuality. We talk to men often about the fact that they are, they are actors, they are agents, they are the ones who desire, mm. um, they act upon the world and women are more acted upon. Mm. Men are the kind of dominant ones, women are the sidekicks, right? Yep. And that sex in that kind of framing is about men you know, that men are naturally sexual, men are naturally the ones who desire, and women are taught to think about sex as something that belongs to men, mm. that they either accommodate or manage for men. So to make it a little simpler, that we talk to men about desire and we talk to women about desirability. Wow. Yeah. And so while we, in, in some sense, you'd say, oh, well, men are lucky because they're being told that at least they can legitimately be sexual beings where right. women are taught that they shouldn't be. And then that is a problem. I mean, this is what so much of my, I do an online course called The Art of Desire for Women. Um, and it's really looking at the ways that the cultural messaging has been, they've been taught to kind of suppress what they want not just in sex, but just in their lives in general, to kind of be a sidekick for somebody else, to be the support for other people's desires is a way to be feminine. And <clears throat> of course, that interferes with this sort of real integration of becoming a whole person. And so, but I talk about this, that a lot of times women are taught to think about sexuality as something that men do, that men want, and how can you be the right kind of woman to be desirable? So wow. be virtuous, don't, don't, don't have been too sexual, dress in a way that's modest, but not too frumpy, you know, so you have to be attractive, but not too attractive. <laughs> it's like, and it's all in reference to like, what does a man want? That yeah. becomes the way you think about what it is to be sexual. And, <clears throat> and so in order to be desirable, a lot of women feel like I should, I should suppress this part of myself. Now, hopefully it'll magically all open up once we get married and he's going to lead the way yeah. into my sexuality, yeah. um, which never goes well but but so so it's like putting it away as a way to maintain a sense of being good because if you're a good woman you're not that sexual so that's why you see these cultural problems of, of sexual repression and sort of pushing down of self pushing down of sexuality in a lot of women um and then they don't know how to flip the switch once they get married yeah. because it's something they have pushed away which is often part of these sexual challenges that we're going to get to here in a minute, but you know, it's because there's no, there's no, um, that the woman at least who has pushed it down or pushed it away in order to maintain a sense of herself as being good, um, can't validate her own sexuality. She can't be at peace with it. So she's often looking to her partner to make it be okay, which is problematic because he has his own anxieties about sex yep. <laughs> in a lot of the couples that I work with. The men, they, they're being told that, yes, you're, you're, you're sexual because you're a man yep. and men are sexual. And, you know, women should control this in part by the way they dress, like very problematic message because they should, uh, they're the sober Jennifer, I wish I could say, this isn't true. This is not the message. And it's like, yeah, this is the message. And it's so yeah. systemic. And this is what people experience. Yeah. And it's, it's yeah. so pervasive that we're not aware of it. Because it, it just right. is the message. And so we don't question it's it. We don't message. reflect. 
it's not you think okay yeah that's I guess that's how it is and and since women are the sober drivers they're not that sexual well they should they should take more control of this don't dress too sexy not fair and of course i agree that women should be respectful of the people around them and not be trying to seduce people okay right. to their <laughs> desirability of course but th but we give the message kind of that men are barely handling it so you know put yourself in a burlap bag so that nobody can see that you're actually a woman under there you know it, it's kind of like you know men can't handle it so you yeah. should very problematic because Women then are not, not only are they pushing down their sexuality, they're hyper attuned to managing the sexuality of the men around them. And um, that's a total setup for disaster in marriage. Yeah. It just does not work. You, you start resenting that you feel like you have to manage your husband's sexuality. And you'd much rather not be sexual at all than to feel like you've got a job to do after you've taken care of the kids all day. And so it just is a setup for desire plummeting once you get married. So, okay, but so back to the men. So the men, you know, are often taught, okay, well, you're legitimately sexual in the sense that it's inherent to being masculine, but sex is something you do to a woman, right? Mm -hmm. So even though there's a the hope that she's going to want it and everything, there's a kind of a dual message that if she's a good woman, she's only, she's partly doing it to be kind and loving, you know, wow. <laughs> uh, not because she's full of desire. And your hope was if she's full of desire, it's only about me, you know, and only for me <laughs> and reinforces me. But so there's a kind of, it's something you do to a woman. It's not really a shared model. And if you're a sensitive guy, you may be ambivalent about doing to a woman what yep. she doesn't want done unto her. <laughs> All right. And, and, and then there's also, it's framed and it's kind of inherently selfish, you know, I mean, like where if she wants it, it can be good and unifying. There's sort of a dual message. It can be that, but you have to be really careful because it can get out of control and you could get out of control and it's kind of playing with fire. And so there is this kind of dual message. I think that men get of both. You're entitled to this. You, if you get married, you're going to have sex for eternity and she's going to accommodate you. Oh. <laughs> but <laughs> it feels so rough. Like, Cause you just kind of pull back the curtain. Like this is the message. Yeah. This is what it plays yeah. out. And you're like, Oh, I don't know. I don't want to hear this, but this is the story yeah. that I yeah. hear over and over where men are not capable yeah. of managing their own sexuality. And so right. they can kind of do whatever. And it's women's responsibility yeah. to now manage it. And That's nobody's right. going to enjoy right. this kind of an imbalance in a relationship. Right. And it also drives a kind of underground contempt for women. Because if you, that woman evokes in you feelings you're not supposed to have, well, you're mad at her. Like, her how fault. dare her? Yeah, it's right. It's partly her fault. And like, she's making me feel things I'm not supposed to feel. And so it's like, it becomes a way in which the woman is the problem. Rather than no, I have a responsibility to myself and others to handle my sexuality. I mean, those are the de desirable men are able to handle their sexuality, not deny it and repress it, but handle it responsibly. And so, so when we get the idea that it's half women's job, that works against men. So it kind of fosters entitlement, but also kind of shame and ambivalence because I'm doing a men's course right now called The Art of Loving, right? And I was gonna call it The Art of Desirability, but I thought that might feel a little too insulting to men. Like The Art of Desire is the women's course and The Art of Desirability, but, but The Art of Loving. So how, how do you, how are you in a more peaceful relationship with sexuality? And it's been really painful for me to read what a lot of these men are writing oh, about, yeah. about how much pain and anguish they feel about the existence of their sexuality because they're partnered with somebody who is ambivalent herself, who isn't sure she wants a sexual relationship. And he's kind of looking to her to make it okay. And she can't or won't do that. And, um, and then they feel like, I'm afraid like that if I am sexual, that on some level I'm gonna be taking advantage of her because she has her own ambivalence and uncertainty about this. You can start to see why somebody would rather go to porn where it's safer to be sexual, yep. where you can feel feelings and not have to actually be in the ambivalent, anxious arena of sex with a partner, right? And I, I'm not trying to say that makes it good and, and and healthy for somebody, but you can see why somebody might want to go where it's not so exposed and frightening. Yeah. Um, and so there's a lot of 
angst about whether or not you can be sexual and good. And I think we say the words that you can, but we haven't done a good job culturally of showing people how that can in fact be true. Yeah. And so it's, especially when we try to vilify sex and vilify desire or embodied desire and think that that turns you into a rotten person, well, it would be, obviously you just wanna stay as far away from it as possible if that's true, except for reproduction. But yeah. that isn't true. It's, you know, how am I in relationship to this gift and does it create strength in me and strength in my partnership or not? That, you know, that's a different way of thinking about it that's really critical for being able to create deeper peace within oneself and within one's relationship. Yeah, I love all that. It, it's so refreshing to hear you talk about that. Because I think it's, yeah. the messages are so pervasive. I start to doubt myself almost because yeah. the people yeah. I work with that are struggling with pornography, they absolutely hate themselves and they hate yes. their sexuality and they hate sexual contact. And then their partners are struggling too, where it's like, yeah, I don't like this either. And I don't like you. I don't like sexuality. There's such a negative relationship. Absolutely. And I keep trying to shift back to, hey, let's get back to understanding these cultural messages and taking responsibility that it's, yeah. you know, you're choosing yeah. to view. And, and this is not just about the sexual images. Like there's a dynamic here. There's a dance, yeah. there's an expectation. But that seems like a different language for some people where it's like, no, nah, no, nah, it's, just, it's just the sexual images. If that was gone, we'd be good to go. And it's like, oh, right. it, there's, just, there's just so much more. And I think yeah. it, it is so infused in our upbringing that it's hard to see it and hard to get a foothold. But I think when people yeah. start to turn inward and look at, yeah, where is this coming from? Is this some discomfort I yeah. have around my body or intimacy or just vulnerability yeah. in a relationship? I see people yeah. moving past this and navigating this pretty quickly. It's just that yeah. inward that's so challenging. Uh, yeah, I have found working with people that if we can get it out of the frame of, I'm a rotten person for this, and I'm a terrible human being, and it doesn't, how to say it, it's almost the framing is, if I were to go three years and never look at porn, then I would know that I'm okay. And I would say, <laughs> that doesn't necessarily mean you're okay. Meaning to yeah. just never look at a sexual image doesn't mean that you have grown up around your relationship to your sexuality and your sense of self and really being at peace with yourself. Like it's hyper-focused on a, an expression of a problem yep. rather than am I whole? Am I living in a way that's at peace? Am I in relationship to a pleasure in a way that makes my life richer and better? and blesses my relationship. That's the organizing question for me in working with couples and working with people individually around how they are in relationship to this divine gift of sexuality. I love um, that. And that's so, the big shift yeah. for a lot of people coming yes. in and they say, I'll be happy if I don't have this problem anymore. If I didn't yeah. look at porn anymore. And that it doesn't yeah. even almost cross our minds that, you know, what is sexual health? It's, it's not That's just right. the absence of a problem, but what That's could right. it truly mean That's for right. you in your relationship? And that for me is exciting yeah. to think about, hey, if we let go of yeah. this, I got to eliminate this one thing, what could we create right. and develop for you? And the possibilities right. are incredible. That's right. Uh, and I do think it's probably worth saying, you know, I do think it's true that having the instant gratification of porn so easily available can become a derailment that is problematic for people. Like if it weren't there, maybe it would have been easier to exercise the right muscles to create yeah. something healthier. But uh, so that's true, I think, but it's not necessarily true that therefore they would then be in a healthier relationship with sexuality because I think it's a part of human development that many people don't develop. I mean, members of a faith or not, that to really be in a healthy, trustworthy position with themselves and with a partner around their sexual nature. That's a part of human development that a lot of us step away from or avoid. Because um, I think sexuality is a harder part of self-acceptance for most yeah. of us. 
And so a lot of us take easier paths in a sense, um, porn being one of them and, and a particularly compelling one since the dawn of the internet and the privacy of that. So it's a little bit like getting locked in a candy store when you want to be somebody who eats healthfully. Yep. It's like, okay, that's not, that's not easy. You have to figure out why is it? And, and one of the problems we do is we make people feel that they're rotten because they're drawn to the Snickers. It's like, well, no, being drawn to the Snickers makes you normal. Yep. But the Snickers, and especially a big diet of Snickers, is not going to give you the life you want. Right. It is not going to teach you how to really be in a healthy relationship to your embodiment and food and well-being and peace of mind. And, and so you can acknowledge the difficulty of having being surrounded by a candy store, but don't pathologize yourself for the draw. Yeah. Then think about how am I going to create what's going to really make my life rich and better and make me capable of, of an intimate partnership, which is way better than any Snickers bar. <laughs> like porn can never give somebody what an intimate partnership can offer. And I think obviously people struggling with porn instinctively know that. Yeah. I love that imagery of that candy shop because for me, pornography yeah. very much is it's, it's empty calories. It's sugar. It might yeah. be sweet. It's, it's not right. sustaining. It's not fulfilling. Right. It's, it's not connection. Right. It isn't right. that, but it makes right. sense why people are drawn to candy. That's just kind yes. of how we're built. And so I think, it's it's how we're built. yeah. And it's a fine line to walk where there's a belief that if somebody's struggling with porn, it's pathological or it's an addiction. Yeah. It's some disorder. Where in my right. mind, it, it makes more sense that it's more developmental. Where like you said, That's right. yeah, we're still growing and we develop physically and emotionally and spiritually and sexually too. But for yeah. a lot of people, we're like, no, no, that one doesn't count. We don't, we don't need to yeah. develop there. We're terrifying. Yeah. yeah. And I think about right. all the time and energy I've put to my physical health with eating well right. and exercising and playing sports. Right. And my phys and my right. emotional and mental health with all the training and conversations and mindfulness work. Right. And I think about, you know, sure. what have I done to grow my spiritual side or my sexual side? It's like, right. wow, probably not near as much as any of the other ones. Yeah. And a fear, like even to want to do that or think that way, doesn't that make you a little bit like a bad person? <laughs> you know, cause like you said in the beginning, it's so laden with this kind of fear. And so I think you've found this too. Anytime I start to say, can we just start to look at the question? People are like, why are you pro porn? I'm like, wait, I am not pro porn. I'm not, you know, so it's almost like if you don't just shame it, shame it, shame it, you're somehow inviting it. And I'm saying when you slam it down so fast, you're interfering with what the wisdom that you need yeah. to be able to solve it. Um, and so if you want to live in greater integrity and greater peace of mind, you need to settle down enough to just take a look and understand what is happening. What is this expressing about me? What is this showing me about myself? Or I've said to, you know, the partners of people that are looking at porn to women, usually in this case, if you just go into shame and punishment, you're interfering with your ability to see who your partner is and mm. to better understand what's happening. That's not the same thing as condoning or saying, you know, you're, you're fine with it, or, but, but settle down enough to understand. Because if you're gonna be able to solve it as a couple, you've gotta see what's there, which is uncomfortable and is stretching people to grow. But it's, yeah. you, know, you know, as a lot of times people say, you know, the, the, what is it, the barrier is the path or the, you know, the impediment is the path the, the oftentimes we, the greatest wisdom lies in the areas we least want to look yep. um, because we're afraid of what's there. But that's when you really profess to believe in truth and truth setting you free. It often means looking at things that are unpleasant to look at and understanding yeah. things that scare you, but you stay the course, you, then you can often find the key to your freedom. Yeah, that's wonderful. And so many times I've seen that the problem that somebody has, it's really more of an opportunity and it's, it's a growth right. opportunity. And these problems can yeah. be teachers. They can be unifying. Right. But I think we are yeah. such emotional creatures where we are so scared to even, like you said, calm down to take a look yeah. and be objective. Yeah. 
And that is so challenging. Yeah. And I think I've got that same kind of response to some of the interviews or podcasts and resources I put out online where because I, I try to look at what are all the factors and what's going on, there's often a pushback where you don't think porn's an issue then. It's like, how did you get that? Like, clearly yeah. we're, we're talking about this, but when you try to talk about it and maybe at a little more complex angle and you're not leading yeah. with it, you've got to really focus on how terrible this is. That yeah. message is so different. I think sometimes it's challenging yeah. for people to hear it. Absolutely. Like I had a client who was very compulsive it, with food and sweets. And so she was always, she never shared any sweets because she would kind of hoard them. Mm -hmm. And e even to the point that she felt horrible, like she did not, it's not like she was enjoying those candy bars. Yeah. And so we changed it where it was like, you must have seven candy bars in your clock cupboard at all times. <laughs> and uh, you can eat it whenever you want to. I mean, yeah. and, and so as soon as she took it out of this struggle of if I do it, I'm a horrible human being. It's like, no, I'm, when she kind of, like she actually found herself, she ate like almost an entire one, like these were big candy bars the first day. And the second day she had like a third of one and gave some to her son, which she's like, I never share. Wow, never. interesting. <laughs> so my point is that once she kind of started like just not, the vilification was actually driving it. Yes. And when she started to then think about like, why am I going there anyway? Like that became like, now there was some room to actually think about, it's not really making me happier, nope. you know? So it's, it's not, I'm not, you know, sometimes like having a bit of chocolate makes me happier, but it's like, why, why am I doing that? So there's like a struggle for self. Sometimes when you put down such a rigid limit and, and I'm not trying to say you should look at porn so you don't look at it too much. That's not my message. Just to be clear, I'll explain more what I mean in a sense. But when you put down this, like, I can't, or I'm a horrible human being, it actually means you now, a perverse part of your mind rebels against that. And yep. is still trying to prove that it belongs to itself by defying the rule at your own expense. So a lot of times I'll say to people, of course you can look at porn. Like your history proves that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, doesn't matter what, you know, the church leader has said, what your wife has said, what your conscience even says, yeah. you still can. I think the question is that what you want, Yep. you know, who do you want to be around this and why and why not? And so it, when people start to get back in the driver's seat, rather than feeling like all these things are controlling them, they become surprisingly able. Yeah to drive the car. <laughs> That's the key. And I think about, you highlight a couple of these paradoxes and I think they're as mm -hmm. old as the Garden of Eden. Like the second we say, you yeah. can't have this, it's like, whoa. Yeah. Now we're going to focus all of our yeah. energies to right. acquire that. I think that is kind of human nature. And so I've had That's this right. chat at times with people struggling with porn and I'll say, you know, what is it that you get out of it? What is it that you enjoy about it? And they're like, nothing. I, no, I don't. I don't want any of it. <laughs> And it's like, well, How dare you even say it? Yeah. yeah, it seems like blasphemous to bring that up. But I yeah. think about often, just like the candy, people are binging viewing sexual images without enjoying it or noticing it. That's right. It's like, how can we eat that Snickers yeah. and look at this porn as fast as we can and get it over with? And sometimes right. I'll say, hey, you're probably going to look this week anyway. What would it be like to slow right. down and maybe notice what you are enjoying or Maybe some of the reasons yeah. why you're viewing, what do you get out of this? And often it's like, no, that's, we can't do that. But I think what you yeah. said is key is we need to create more room. And just slowing yes. down and observing creates that space to then decide, is this something I want to do or not? Because yes. we are the ones choosing our actions. But when we're binging yes. Snickers bar, the sexual images, it feels like yes. agency kind of disappears. And if we yeah. slow it down and take away the judgments and the shame and the thou shalt nots, you can actually start yes. to see what's before you and you can choose yes. to view or not. And it really yes. unlocks that, that precious gift of choice, of agency. Yes. And, you know, as soon as you own something as your choice, you know, it, it changes how everything feels. Um, you know, I was like, 
remembering this story because I used to paint houses to earn money with my brother and he was kind of hiring me. So he was in charge. And the days were so long, I was the slowest painter and I wasn't trying to be slow. I just felt like the locus of control was in him, not in me. So it was like, when's lunch? Can we have lunch already? <laughs> like, I was always, always trying to get out of feeling controlled. Well, the next year I decided to do it myself, but become an interior painter. And then I was hiring my sister. Now the locus of control was in me. It was my thing. I became fast, efficient. The days were faster. I mean, I was doing hard work, yeah. but I didn't see it as like somebody's controlling my life. I was controlling my life. And then my sister was the one I'm like, come on, Jane, like get going. <laughs> <laughs> bossing her around and she's resisting me. So, so, you know, that, that locus of control thing is really, really critical because as soon as you put it outside of yourself, you're, you're not lined up internally and you're going to then be in reaction in a lot of times perverse ways, trying to prove to yourself that you belong to yourself, but often at your own detriment. And so I think that's a key piece. That makes all the difference is really, yeah taking responsibility for your own thoughts, your own emotions, yeah. urges, sexuality. Yeah. And anytime we yeah. give that up to somebody else or an external filter or a partner to do that work for you, we're stuck. Mm -hmm. We're trapped. Absolutely. Because all that is really exactly. coming from within. That's right. And, you know, yeah. And so like in the, the Art of Loving course that I'm doing for men, it's like a lot of times they are kind of putting it in their wife. Like, I believe sex is a good thing. And they'll kind of talk like that. Therefore, you should feel good about it and make it okay for me. So they're kind of acting like they feel clear that sex is good, but they're more demanding that their wife feel good about it so that they can feel good about it. And I'm not being dismissive of the difficulty of being in a dynamic where a partner doesn't want sex with you. But I'm trying to help people come back to the locus of control within themselves. Like, why would it make sense, perhaps, that my partner would not enjoy sex with me. And, and that doesn't mean that they're hundred percent right and you're hundred percent wrong, but like what, what's happening in this dynamic that they would find it um, make sense for them to push away from me. And what is it that I need to deal with in myself to be clear about the legitimacy of what I'm offering as a sexual partner? And how do I need to deal with myself to be more at peace with who I am as a human being and as a sexual human being, because a lot of times we want our partner to tell us we're okay by either wanting the same things we want or telling us we're so desirable, even when we're functioning undesirably, rather than dealing with ourselves and really who we are and being at peace with who we are. Then we're much more compelling as a, as a sexual partner because both we're not looking for our spouse to make it okay. We are actually functioning in a way that's more trustworthy and more compelling and that's the way to really um be at peace with yourself even yeah. if your spouse doesn't deal with herself or himself yeah you know what though that so, sounds like a lot of hard work it, it seems you know, it, a lot it, easier to have your partner reassure you or find an accountability buddy sure. or find a filter then all these things sure. are going to be okay but what you're advocating yeah. for is this actually takes some introspection some conversations, yeah. some learning. Yeah. And there's not a yeah. quick fix for human sexuality no, or pornography concerns. No, there's not. And, but which is not to say that I don't see people make meaningful and substantive progress all the time. Yep. So that is to say human development takes courage. It takes honesty. It takes personal responsibility. It takes a willingness to look at what you don't want to see. You know, I was just working with a couple this morning that, you know, he's always kind of in this, I get things and I'm really waiting for my wife to catch up kind of mm -hmm. position. And you know, he's a good guy, but, but he, uh, they often frame it that way. Like I've done all the research on sexuality and she's got all these anxieties. He really likes this idea that he's the strong one and, and he's being patient. And, you know, I sort of flipped it on its head and said, you know, you do that as a way to not have to look at yourself as a way to not have to deal with why she might not want to be sexual with you. Yeah. And the reality is she holds all the wisdom that you need about who you are because she sees you better than you see you. And she has a lot she could teach you about how you could be a more desirable person. And, and I don't mean it like that 
she's there just, but she sees his limitations yep. and he doesn't want to deal with them. And so that takes courage because it it's much easier to be like, hey, read this book, honey, rather than talk to me about why you don't like having sex with me. That's a much yeah. scarier question. It is. And so, <laughs> but that's where you learn. That's where you grow up. That's where you get stronger because you can't be strong and be in self-deception. Yeah. And so, the, you know, integrity literally makes you a stronger person. And so that takes courage, that takes time, but the gift of it is deeper and deeper peace when you start dealing with the aspects of yourself that you're afraid to look at. And so the gift of pornography, to put it that way, is it's exposing I have an issue of internal contradiction. And as terrifying as it is, as much as I don't like the fact that it's evidencing itself, I do have an opportunity to learn something about who I am, who we are as a couple, how I'm in relationship to my sexuality and what I want to kind of learn from what my behavior is trying to show me. That's beautiful. And I think about that, that pornography often is that symptom of that lack of awareness and lack of development and just discomfort navigating vulnerability in relationships. And, but it is an opportunity. And in many ways, the struggles we have are gifts to point us towards where we need to grow. And there's so many times I've sent people your direction because you've created so many platforms and programs to help people. I wonder if you could do a quick rundown about what people could sure. benefit from based on the resources you put together. Sure. Great. So, well, there's, um, two things just that are free and straight up is like I have the Jennifer Finlayson five podcast archive. So I have like over a hundred interviews on different topics around spirituality, sexuality, relationships, you know, uh, that are all there. Um, and then also I have online a Facebook group called ask an LDS uh, marriage and sexuality therapist group that we post resources, people ask questions, you know, people can get input from other people. And I do a Facebook live every month where I take on a topic um, and and that, that somebody's posted in the group and I take different questions on the same theme and, and respond to it. So there's that. And then I do online courses, um, one uh, strengthening your relationship course and enhancing sexual intimacy, which are two couples courses that are really helping people address the foundational aspect of their relationship in the strengthening your relationship course. And really it's about looking at yourself more honestly and getting stronger and more solid in who you are. And then the Enhancing Sexual Intimacy course is about, it's a couple sexuality course of looking at the meanings that are operating in the couple that are interfering with desire and collaboration, sexual collaboration. Um, and so those are two couples courses, but then I also have an Art of Desire women's sexual self-development course. Um, I really call it a self and sexual development course mm -hmm. because it's also about deepening your relationship to yourself and who you are and what you want and what you're about and how you're integrating your sexuality and your eroticism is fundamental to being a strong woman um, and, and a woman at peace with herself. And then I have the art of loving, which is the equivalent course of men's um, sexuality course. And this is also very much about self and character development and sexual integration. Um, and how you come to deeper peace with yourself without denying your sexuality, but also being in relationship to your sexuality in a way that blesses your life and your partnership. So, um, and then I have a How Do You Talk to Your Kids About Sex course that's about teaching sexual integrity to kids. So, um, so yeah, those are all those things. And on my website is where you can find all those resources. So, Perfect. which is just my name, inlaysonfife.com. Yeah. And those so, resources yeah. are wonderful. So if you're like, I don't know where to go. I, I didn't get this kind of background. Yeah. or I, I don't know how to grow myself or with my sexual identity. I mean, you've, I mean, the, the work that I've come across that you've put together, it's so grounded. It's so thoughtful. Yeah. It's respectful of people's kind of faith and background. But it's yeah. also very honest yeah. where it's like, we need, yeah. we do need to do this work and we can have yeah. different views on this and, I get the religious yeah. piece, but we still need to do this. And I think yes. that seems like a really healthy place to start. Yeah. And I think even in the best of our theology and any meaningful faith is about becoming strong people able to create goodness 
through our human experience, meaning as sexual embodied beings to really be able to be in relationship to that embodiment in a way that creates good, creates peace. And so our faith should facilitate the way we're in relationship to our faith, the way we're in relationship to the gift of our embodiment. We need to see it as a, as a pathway into deeper spiritual and interpersonal capacity. So that's really what I'm trying to help people to do is understand their, their, uh, this developmental path that leads them into greater freedom and greater peace. I love that. And they're all compatible. Like religion and sexuality do not need to be competing. These can all fit and contribute to that peace. In fact, people talk about their, their highest, their most transcendent experiences of feeling a kind of, um, connection to sort of the, the, the most transcendent and divine realities is often through meaningful, loving sexuality. Yeah. intimate sexuality so they are actually much more not only is the pathway to becoming a more uh anchored person in your sexuality about developing skills that also increase your spirituality that the experience itself can be very linked to the most transcendent understanding of oneself and of the divine wow i love it well i just got one more question for you and it's probably more personal sure. where sure I love my counseling space. For me, it's a sacred space. I enjoy being able to provide that where we can really kind of let the walls down and and understand the things that people have experienced and encountered. And that's my safety zone is just doing good therapy work. So branching out online, like doing interviews and putting life after pornography program up there and doing a Ted talk is terrifying for me. It's it's really scary and difficult. Sure. And so it's re- really reassuring to find other people that's doing this work, good work too. But yeah. I'm curious, what compels you to keep doing this? Because I know for me, when I get a message from somebody that says, hey, you know, this podcast, this program was life-changing, it does everything for me. But I also sure. get a lot of like pushback and backlash and that part's kind of scary. Like, how do yeah. you manage that? Um. It's a great question. It used to be a lot harder on me when I got the negative feedback than it is now. Um, Maybe because I just see, first of all, I don't get everything right. It's not like, you know, I can't sometimes misstep or misspeak or, or, you know, have my own thinking evolve, of course. But I think that the thing that's the biggest antidote for me is that I just know it helps people. Yeah. And people that need help, good people that need more clarity. And I feel that I have been given a gift, a capacity to see some of this. And so I feel a sense of responsibility um, to do my best to articulate what I see and how I see it. And people can see things differently and they, they may disagree even, but, but even giving people an honest articulation, I think is helpful for helping people organize their own thinking and and their own minds. And, and, you know, human beings are wonderful and we have so much capacity to do good in the world. And so anything I can do to facilitate that in others, not only makes me a better human being, but I hope it helps others to live up to their capacity. So it just, I, it's, I feel very, very grateful to be able to do this work. And so the occasional negative thing, it's worth it. And I, I don't actually, I mean, sometimes I do things, I'm like, you know what, that person's right. I shouldn't have done that or that's wrong. <laughs> but even if it's just somebody like, just because they're overwhelmed by what I'm saying, I genuinely at this point feel usually some compassion for where they are and that it is hard. These are scary things. I understand it. And that's often the first impulse is to kind of push back. Um, But I think there's people that have pushed back who have kind of, um, you know, that sometimes I've responded to, and I think they've then been able to soften and start to think about it. And it actually has helped some of these people. That's awesome. That's incredible. And so much of that resonates with me where it feels like, there's a responsibility to help people 
who are struggling. Yeah. And if we have information and kind of a mindset or yeah. some skills to help them, it's like, yeah, even though yeah. it may be challenging and scary at times, it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And I think it feels like the integrity yeah. thing to do to really try Absolutely. to improve people's walk in this life. A hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, for taking some time. Um, I always have learned a lot from you and I appreciate the things that you shared with us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me.